Okay. So yes, thank you all for coming. Welcome to this week's CCND seminar session. It's my great, uh, great pleasure to introduce Sven Ohl, who came from Humboldt University to us. Um, all the way, all the way. Uh, so a bit in this uh, semester, we have also invited quite some people from the Berlin community so that one is like knowing who is working on what and like is updated on each other's research. So it's always nice to have people uh, come over. Uh, great that you uh, came here yeah. also. So for you as introduction, like so Sven was studying originally um, psychology in Potsdam. Mm -hmm. Uh, multiple stays abroad was then also doing the diploma in Potsdam and then for the PhD also uh, working in Potsdam with Professor Reinhold uh, Kliegel and uh, Stefan Brandt. Mm. Uh, then you were joining Martin Rolf's group yep. uh, most uh, for, for quite a time, but like always with like your own um, uh, projects where you were PI within the uh, research projects that you were leading. Uh, multiple consecutive ones to then now since uh, this year having a junior research uh, group in the Heisenberg program. So uh, Sven's uh, group is called Mind in Action Lab. And so like now we are very excited what the Mind in Action Lab is doing currently, yeah. uh, what you're doing in your research. Yeah. And uh, thank you for coming over. That stage is yours. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And thank you for yeah this huge crowd being here. Awesome. Um, all right, uh, as Timo said, I started the Mind in Action Lab in April this year, and we have two core research topics. So first of all, we study active vision and active visual working memory, and that's just a smart way for saying that we're looking for how we perceive and how we remember um, across eye movements. So we're having eye movements and then check visual working memory performance and how it's affected. And the second topic that we're interested in is how we um, detect causal relations in our environment um, and how this is implemented in the visual system. And today I will present uh, research in, in, from this research domain. All right, the main motivation um, in this field goes something like this. Um, understanding physical events in terms of their cause and effect is fundamental for making sense of the dynamics in the external world. Yeah, that's a bigger idea. So for instance, for this person over here, it makes sense to have um, a causal model for how to cross a busy street and also being able to simulate that model and make predictions that if you could cross the street right now, you would cause an accident basically uh, with these um, bikes over here. Um, and that's a topic that's typically called causal um, judgments um, or you know, causal attributions in such a situation are typically referred to as uh, causal judgments. But there's also a very different class of sensory events, um, which is thought to elicit strong causal impressions already from within the visual system. So without thinking. Yeah. And types of these sort of stimuli are a tennis serve like this here. That's the moment of the tennis serve is the idea that the visual system can pick up actually um, this, uh, this interaction already and label it with causal versus non-causal, or a baseball hit, or uh, someone kicking a football. So it's very prominent in sports, but also exists in every uh, day life situations, like slicing an onion, oh, that works here, yeah, or opening a car, or uh, hammering a nail over here. So this debate between perceptual and cognitive accounts um, go back or look back actually a very long time in, in, in the history of psychology. And a very prominent example here is the billiard shot, which I show you here in slow motion. And David Hume uh, used this example to argue uh, that we actually learn associations between the movement of the first ball and the second ball, and then we infer cognitively uh, the causal structure, how they relate to each other, so it's cognition. Um, but then uh, the experimental psychologist Albert Michot entered the stage and said, no, that's actually perception. The visual system can deal with that already. So what did Michot do differently than Hume? Well, Hume is a philosopher and Michot was an experimental psychologist, so uh, the, the, the difference is in the methods. And uh, what Michaud did is he presented deliberately abstracted interactions between very simple visual stimuli. So removing the texture and the shading and all those components, removing the background. And he presented these sort of stimuli to his participants. 
And uh, the participants or observers then spontaneously reported that the first disk launched the motion of the second disk in these, uh, in these sort of examples. Uh, and I hope you're with me that you see something very similar and labeling them already as the cause and the effect or the launcher and the launchy, and depending on the literature, they are also referred to as the agent and the patient. <coughs> Sorry. So that's the stimulus, and the task in these old tasks was basically to rate your causal impression, and that's a very subjective task, and it's also difficult because the participants need to know, oh, what do they mean by causal, and makes things very complicated, and the task has been criticized a lot. Anyways, Michot uh, ran more than 100 experiments using that stimulus based on the launching effect, and he published a book um, with the title The Perception of Causality. And I mean, the title is giving, giving it already away, uh, but the key message of the book is uh, that the impressions um, of causal relation um, are perceived um, and they occur fast, automatic, and irresistible. So what does that mean? Um, fast basically means it's so immediate that you don't think about it. And that's one of the core arguments why it's a perceptual thing. You don't have to think about what's happening there. You have this immediate impression, oh, there's a causal interaction going on. <laughs> All right. Um, irresistible is something like um, the arguments that you also see for visual illusions. So even if uh, you know it is a visual illusion, you still see it, yeah? So you still see emotion in the uh, rotating snake illusion, although you know there's nothing moving. Um, and stimulus driven means basically this. I'm gonna show you again um, this video of the slow motion uh, billiard shot. And I now take only one slice, a horizontal slice, and I plot this one over time, yeah? And this is called the space-time plot. And this is basically a uh, representing visually what's happening during interaction, uh, during a collision. And we know that um, orientation in the space-time plot is basically motion. That's this part over here that you can see. And also this little part is motion. And the critical question is what are now those visual features in that interaction uh, that drive the detection of um, such causal relations. And Michot um, actually claimed that uh, those la the launching effect or the perception of it is even modular. That means it's not learned. It's something that is innate um, that even um, newborn children should have. Oh, sorry, that's something else. I'm getting there in a second. <laughs> uh, so what um, Michot did a lot in his experiments is basically looking also at those parameters and how they relate to the causal impressions. And he was first looking at the temporal domain um, and if you delay, for instance, the onset of the second disk, that would be a delayed launch. And he said, uh, most observers perceive here something um, non-causal. It appears as if the second disk moved autonomously, yeah, and not driven by the, the launch of the first disk. And second, uh, it matters, uh, or the, 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 the spatial parameters matter. So here we have, we will see in a second that the first disk is fully overlapping with the second disk, and then the second disk is starting to move. And it looks like a pass, yeah? It looks like there's no causal interaction. The stimuli is simply passing, so very different phenomenology. Um, yeah, so Michot claimed this would be um, um, innate, and so a lot of, there's a lot of developmental psychology work in that direction, showing that even um, children at the age of 27 weeks have uh, these causal categories, for instance. There's only very little neurophysiological work in that um, direction or in that domain. And fMRI studies that exist point somehow to a network um, where also um, visual areas are involved. And probably the strongest support for an implementation in the visual system comes from a behavioral technique from uh, recent adaptation studies that showed that we can actually change the way we perceive these causal relations using classical adaptation protocols. And in the rest of this presentation, I will make heavy use of this uh, adaptation protocols. So I'll show what I'm doing there in a second. But first, I want to give you an overview of what you can expect in that talk. So we basically use this old technique in a new setting, yeah? And uh, look what features of this plot underlie the perception of causality. And then we go one step further and we try to separate the role uh, of the cause and the effect. 
And uh, in the third part, we'll look at contextual influences on the perception of causality. All right, let's start with um, what features underlie the perception of causality. All right, so in an adaptation protocol, we present uh, these repeated collisions to observers. And we, by doing this, we do this for a minute or so, uh, we change um, how these participants perceive ambiguous test events later. But the key message here is, as for color, orientation, and motion, we can change the perception of causality by adapting. And uh, the result from adaptation is that after the adaptation, um, participants report the, uh, that they detect fewer launches um, or fewer collisions or fewer causal relations as compared to before adaptation. Yeah, that's the key main, uh, main finding. And we can now use this tool um, to reveal the visual basis underlying the perception of causality by presenting an adapter and a subsequent test event that differ in some characteristic. Yeah? And when uh, we then can determine whether or not the adaptation transfers um, from the adapter to the test event and conclude that that particular um, feature that we changed in the stimulus, um, that um, this is um, a critical element basically uh, for detecting um, the, these causal relations. And this rationale has been applied in a number of studies. Uh, it showed, for instance, that the adaptation is residing in a retinotopic reference frame. So that speaks again for an implementation in the visual system. Um, that we can even distinguish between different causal categories. So there's not only launching, there are other things like triggering causal relations or entraining, which is something like pushing a stimulus away. Uh, and we can separate them. Uh, using those adaptation protocols, and we use this basically to look at the specific visual features um, that drive um, the perception of causality, and we will look at the role of motion direction, motion speed, motion times uh, color conjunctions, and motion kinematics. And I'll um, go through the first experiment uh, in more detail and then report the uh, results from the other studies. All right, and here is what we did by answering in the first experiment whether the adaptation uh, is direction selective. So we ask participants to fixate here in the center of the screen and then represent test events. And participants' task is to report whether they see a causal launch or a non-causal pass. So critically, we experimentally manipulate the overlap between the two disks, yeah, when the first stops and the second starts to move. And I've told you already, uh, in a situation where the disks are completely overlapping, we typically perceive them as a pass, and they, when they are adjacent to each other, participants typically perceive them as a launch. But we have also these intermediate steps where it's more um, ambiguous. And now we can express the proportion of causal re, um, reports as a function of the disk overlap. Yeah? And what we see here, or what we get, is this nice psychometric curve. Yeah? And as predicted, if there is no overlap, we perceive them as being causal or a launch. And if they're fully overlapping, participants see them as a, as a pass. But that's just a quantification of the behavior, basically a quantification of how participants perceive the causal relation, our stimulus display. In the next step, and what we're interested in, is we present an adapter. And the adapter in our first experiment here is basically a, a, a causal launch in the same direction as the test event. Yeah? So we'll present 320 of these collisions that go from left to right in a narrow uh, motion direction um, range. And then we present in this example a uh, trial, basically a test event and the biggest test event that goes in the same direction as the adapter. Yeah? And if you look at the psychometric curve, we see this huge negative after effect. Yeah? So the curve is shifted to the left, and that means participants are less likely to report seeing a causal relation. Yeah? It's a strong negative after effect. So what's next? Um, and that's the thing that we are interested in. So what happens if we adapt with events from right to left and then present a test event that goes in the opposite direction from left to right, so an incongruent motion direction? And what we see here, and that was surprising to us, we don't see a negative after effect. Yeah? So indeed, 
the adaptation is direction selective or how we perceive causality is uh, encoded in direction selective channels in the visual system, or at least based on their output. So the critical minds might think, okay, maybe you just adapted to motion direction. Yeah, so we need another control condition. And that's something we have here, which is called the slip adapter. And um, I'm gonna show you the events again. That was the launch, or what participants typically perceive as a launch. That's what participants typically perceive as a pass. And in a slip event, uh, the first disk is gonna stop at the other edge of the stationary disk. And only then the, um, uh, the stationary disk starts to move. It looks like that. Again, very different phenomenology. Looks like a double kick, basically. Yeah? But the cool thing about that, um, that stimulus is that it has the same number of disks, too, goes in the same motion direction as the launch, has also two motion onsets and two motion offsets. So it's controlling for a lot of low level stimuli uh, as in the launch. And the question is now, what happens in those conditions? Do we also adapt? And the answer is no. So for these control conditions, we don't see um, a, an adaptation response. And that shows that this negative after effect that we observed here is contingent on the causal impression that participants had. So we extracted the PSEs, that's basically the 50% point of those psychometric curves and plotted it for the individual participants and the group mean for the five different conditions that I display here, the different curves. And you see here um, the uh, PSE uh, before adaptation and the uh, four adaptation conditions. And you see basically one condition only sticks out, which is not surprising, which is the congruent launch direction. Yeah, so I see here the basic uh, effect. So what does that mean? Um, that speaks for a model so that there could be two theoretical models uh, in which each um, motion direction launch is linked to the same causality unit. In that situation, we would expect a, a transfer of adaptation. But what we see is actually more of that sort of model, um, or visualization, <laughs> when Paul is necessarily a model, um, uh, in which you have a particular um, motion, a launch in a particular motion direction, which is linked or embedded in its own um, causality unit or the causality unit is link, uh, embedded in this uh, motion direction channel and we don't see a transfer. All right, so that was pretty surprising to us. So the next step was basically to look at another variable um, in the motion domain, which is motion speed. Um, so we took the same speed as before and uh, looked then whether we see a transfer to a speed that's just half of it, yeah? Um, so I guide you through those experiments. We start again with uh, the psychometric curve before adaptation. Uh, then um, I show you the, now the curve uh, when the adapter speed and the test speed were the same and in the same direction. Um, yeah. And we see the strong negative after effect. And now comes the interesting situation. What happens if we have a certain specific speed and a very different speed during the test situation. Yeah? So um, does that transfer across speeds? And here we see also negative after effects. So this time we see um, invariance or speed invariance or uh, the adaptation transfers across um, speed here. And again, we had those slip conditions to um, control for the low level of features and we see no adaptation in those trials. Uh, anyways, you also, uh, of course, uh, you can always ask questions if you want to again interrupt me. Um, the next experiment that we were asking is whether we see a, a transfer across colors. And that's not just now a stupid strategy like, uh, okay, let's look at another visual feature. This one is actually an interesting one um, because um, it has to do with object identity and how those stimuli looked typically in developmental psychology studies. There, they, the disks had always different colors and the agent had a certain color and the patient had a different color. And the idea is here then basically, oh, there's this red guy who's always launching the green guy. Um, so the red one is the launcher and the green one is the launchee. And the question is whether this, um, um, transfers to a situation where now the green one, which is associated with being the launchee, can also be the agent that launches the second disk. Yeah? Um, and here we start again with a behavior before adaptation. 
And now we'll look at a situation where um, we see exactly the same stimulus during adaptation and test events. And there we see, not surprisingly by now, you should be convinced that uh, we can adapt the perception of causality for these stimuli. You see these strong negative after effects. And now comes the exactly, oh no, and now comes the situation where it's a completely different stimulus, so different direction and different color assignment. And not surprisingly, you don't see any ad adaptation here. But now comes the critical moment where, um, as depicted here, where it's in the same motion direction, but we switch the object identity, yeah, or switch the color now. Now the green one, exactly as depicted here, is launching the red one. And here we see uh, basically the uh, negative after effect. So it's not about the object identity or the color assignment in those, uh, in those stimuli. It's about the motion direction um, or the, the launch embedded in that motion direction. And um, if we um, only, um, if we keep the color assignment and switch directions, we don't see an adaptation. And the same accordingly again in the PSEs. All right, so the last bit of this first package of this first part is asking a very provocative question. Um, and that is, I show you first of all here again a space time plot, yeah, these bit complicated plots over here, and how a launch looks in those space time plots. Basically, I told you orientation, space time is motion um, or motion direction in this here. And you see here the first disk moving, and now it's horizontal, that means it stays here. And the second disk is initially stationary and then starts moving. And we were now asking whether the kinematics drive actually the detection of, those, of these causal relations. And we were wondering whether we could replay the very same <laughs> kinematics as displayed in this space-time plot with a single disk. Yeah, that would look like that. In this situation, there would not be a, a stationary um, second disk but we have the movement of the first disc, which is jumping over like an acceleration to the second um, disc location and then moves. Yeah? So it's basically just um, the uh, kinematics of the stimulus. And it's provocative because that would imply in order to detect a causal relation, in order to um, perceive a collision here uh, for the visual system, you don't need two objects. Uh, that would be pretty surprising. Um, so what we did here is, again, we'll look at the psychometric curves before adaptation. Um, then we'll look at having two disks, so the normal launch is in the same direction. And we see, of course, a negative after effect. And now I show you in the next plot what happens if I replay a launch in the same direction um, as the adapter, but just with a single disk. And there we see it's somehow in between. Uh, <laughs> the good old in-between experiment, which is hard to interpret, uh, but it looks like it, there is some uh, adaptation occurring even with a single stimulus. And for the events in the opposite directions, also it's pretty small. So uh, looking at the PSEs this time gives a bit of a different result, um, because here we see the uh, PSE before adaptation, um, here with two disks after adaptation, that's the, our um, main finding that we replicated it a lot by now. And you see here, basically, those other three conditions are at the same level. So based on this finding, I would say the one disk condition was not strong enough to elicit adaptation. But I uh, don't want to conclude uh, that this is the final uh, remark on that point, because our events are really short, of short duration. They're really fast. They just take 175 milliseconds. That's not a lot. Um, and replaying the kinematics on a 120 hertz screen doesn't give you a lot of frames that you can display on the screen. So um, our next step in this, uh, in this direction is that we want to um, use basically a ProPix system, which is a, a nice projection system that can display stimuli at 1440 hertz, um, uh, which would give us a much more fine-grained temporal resolution to display really the kinematics, including the acceleration of the stimulus. And maybe this is then sufficient to drive adaptation. So it's not clear here at present. All right, so let me conclude uh, the first part, which is adaptation is actually a really powerful classical tool to study um, visual phenomena and also the perception of causality. It's a purely behavioral task. And uh, 
by um, most of our evidence so far basically confirms what also people like Michotte or Scholl, Brian Scholl also said that um, by doing very different tasks that the spatiotemporal parameters matter for detecting these causal relations, but it's not so much about how the stimuli look <laughs> like or how we call it here, the object identity. Um, all right, um, I can skip that here. Um, all right, so let's move on to uh, the second part, which is um, uh, a project where we try to separate the cause and the effect in our um, stimuli. And in this second part, our goal is basically to tease apart the individual role of the cause and the effects of the launch or the launcher and the launchee to uh, the perception of causality. Uh, or saying it differently, we try to decompose their role um, and how they contribute here. And there's, of course, a challenge when we want to separate the cause and the effect in launching events. And that is basically that the location of the cause and the effect is identical. Yeah, So they are confounded here, as you can see, and depicted by the dashed line. Um, so... Uh, right. So the goal of our study is to separate the location of the cause and the effect and to determine how they contribute to causal perception. And that's exactly the point that brings us um, to Newton's cradle. And Newton's cradle is, first of all, a, a physics toy to demonstrate uh, the conservation of momentum and the conservation of energy. And Newton's cradle is also a real world stimulus where cause and effect are separated. Uh, and we still have the impression of a causal interaction going on. And besides that, uh, the stimulus is also uh, fun to watch. Yeah, There are a lot of fantastic YouTube uh, resources that look at Newton's Cradle. And there's also a lot of uh, fast camera shots and that people shoot on Newton's Cradle and see that the bullet is exploding. And a lot of surprising physics stuff on YouTube about that. <laughs> Um, and fun fact, also device is actually only named after Newton, but was invented by uh, the French scientist Edna Mariot. Okay, um, so what can we do with this? Um, we implemented an abstracted version of Newton's cradle uh, in our experiment. And that means basically we have those disks um, and we, try, we separate basically where the launcher stops and the launch starts and fill the intermediate locations with other disks like in Newton's cradle. And the stimulus would look like that, basically. Yeah. Um, I would say it's a bit less of a causal impression as compared to a, um, to a to normal launching effect, but that may vary depending on inter-individual differences and preferences. So what we do with the stimulus is we use this as a adapter. Yeah? So we repeatedly present that, um, and we try to elicit adaptation with that stimulus. It's our adapter. Um, and the question is now whether there will be be adaptation at all, and um, the question is where it will be. Uh, so it could be either at the cause location or, or the effect location. And the implicit logic of our experiment is now, if there is adaptation, then we predict that the adap adaptation should transfer to the perception of causality from the normal launches. Yeah? So we would test here with ambiguous launches at the cause location, and we'll test with ambiguous um, uh, events at the effect location. All right, and now that you've seen so many uh, adaptation results already, uh, I would like to ask you actually about uh, your intuition, yeah, to get, I do this wherever I give this presentation, and I want to see about your vision science uh, intuition. Uh, so I would like to ask you to raise your hand if you think that only the cause location will be adapted. Uh, so for the audience uh, in the internet, it's zero people. <laughs> uh, only the effect location will be adapted. Okay, uh, both locations will be adapted. Oh, the vast majority of neuroscience uh, people here think it's uh, both locations, very fine. And nothing will be adapted. It's always good to have some skeptical people in the audience, by the way. Uh, okay. So one person, thank you. Person. Yeah, thank you. It's good <laughs> to have a skeptical person. All right, and here's how we tested it. Again, participants fixate in the center of the screen. And this time, our adapter is the Newton. Oh, no, sorry. 
that's the test event. So um, again, you see those ambiguous test events, and they can be at two potential locations here, either at the cause location or an effect location, indicated by the dashed lines. They were not visible during the experiments, just for illustration purposes here. And participants had to report whether they saw a launch or a pass. We again manipulate the overlap and again can quantify the perception of causality for those uh, locations. Uh, and now comes again the critical part where we introduce this adapter in addition and adaptation blocks. Yeah? And this is now the Newton's cradle stimulus. And you see here the Newton's cradle stimulus goes from left to right as the test event, but the test event is at the cause location. Yeah? So we have here a condition that would be uh, adaptation at cause location, same direction. But we can do the same thing with the test event at the effect location um, and same direction. And again, uh, as we have observed this direction selectivity before, we change also the direction of the events. So both at the cause and effect location, the event can also go in the different direction. All right, so we look at the results now. And again, we see a negative after effect, yeah? We see again strong adaptation, and that's not something that should, could be expected. That's really surprising because it's a very different stimulus. So we see an adaptation response that transfers from a Newton's cradle stimulus to a launching stimulus, yeah? Um, and this is a, a strong negative after effect for at the cause location when it's in the same direction. So what happens if uh, we look at the effect location? Uh, there's also some adaptation. It's not as strong as at the cost location, uh, and we need to check whether this is actually significant or not, um, but it's a leftward shift. Uh, for events in the opposite direction at the cost location, there's no adaptation, and surprisingly for the effect location, somehow also in between. So now this time, we had to do something else and could not look simply at the PSEs, because every once in a while, if you run a lot of experiments, you will have participants that have beautiful psychometric curves, but still the asymptote is below 50%. And that tells you you can't extract the PSE because uh, PSE is the threshold at 50%. So what we do now is we use a more non-parametric approach, which has also been used by other um, studies before, uh, where we now express uh, the magnitude in ad adaptation on the y-axis, and negative values mean there's negative after effect, positive values mean positive after effect, and do this for all different disk overlaps that we tested here. And then the results look like that, and that's basically the difference now between uh, those psychometric curves, and we see here uh, that all values are negative, showing, and stars mean significant. Um, and that shows basically uh, a strong negative after effect if it's the same direction transfer from the Newton's cradle adapter to launches. And we said already it's directional selective because events in the opposite direction don't drive adaptation. Yeah? Uh, what's happening at the effect location here? Uh, we see also fewer launch reports very systematically. Um, but is, this is true irrespective of the direction of the test event. So in contrast to the cause location, at the effect location, we don't have this directional selectivity, but still a negative after effects, so adaptation uh, responses. So a difference between the cause and lo uh, effect location. <clears throat> all right, uh, so what does it mean? Um, first of all, I want to stress again, we successfully adapted the perception of causality even using a stimulus such as the Newton's cradle stimulus. Um, I think it's pretty interesting that we observe directional selectivity at the cause location, but not the at effect location. It gives, gives us somehow a tool to further study the differences between what the visual system does with the cause and the effect location. But that's where we are at the moment with this result. And the data so far suggested that the adaptation is stronger at the cause location than at the effect location. And we wanted to replicate that in a second experiment. And in addition, we wanted to also check what's happening at those central locations, because one alternative explanation could be that those uh, adaptation fields are really big. Yeah? So basically, we only see adaptation maybe at the cause location, which spreads also to other uh, locations. And maybe there's a gradual decrease, and the adaptation response is just really big at the cause location. So we uh, aimed at addressing or studying uh, the spatial specificity of, of our um, adaptation responses here. 
All right, so we ran exactly the same experiment. This time, always in the same direction. The adapter was in the same direction as the test event. So these were always tested in separate sessions. So you see already, if we have five different adapters, that means participants come five times to the lab um, and run a lot of trials. <laughs> um, and this time we test at three different locations. And yeah, I depict them also. So we have the cause location, the central location, and the effect location. These are the, uh, the psychometric curves before adaptation. Um, after adaptation, you see already, again, those negative after effects. And the critical question in this experiment was what's gonna happen in the central location. And there we don't see a negative after effect. So it's a highly spatially specific uh, finding that we find at the cause and the effect location. Um, and um, actually it's even a positive after effect that we observe over here. And I interpreted it in such a way that um, now that you see at the cause and effect location, say, okay, they don't look causal anymore. Uh, so uh, those central locations look much more causal to you or appear more causal to you because yeah, these were not adapted. And again, these are uh, the, these difference curves, um, those uh, non-parametric um, computations, what's actually significant here or not. So positive after effect for the central location. Okay, uh, so another thing we were wondering about those results was whether participants actually traded off adaptation costs at the cause and the effect location. So it could be that some participants only show strong adaptation at the cause location, but uh, weak adaptation at the um, uh, effect location or vice versa. So we collapsed data across those two experiments. And first of all, by doing this and looking at the magnitude of adaptation at the cause and effect location, they appear now very similar in magnitude. So there's no difference in how strongly you adapt actually to the cause and effect location. It's pretty similar and statistically not different. And now we are pitching uh, the adaptations, a magnitude of adaptation at the effect location versus at the cause location. Um, and what you see here is basically a point cloud. Each participant uh, represents an observer in those experiments. And you can basically see that it's a cluster. Um, so there are different uh, parts of that plot. So that these are people that have negative after effects at both locations. So it's the vast majority. And you have no participant that actually has positive after effects in both locations. Um, and as they, there's no systematic trend here, which um, speaks against a trade-off between adaptation at the cause and the effect location. Okay, um, I wrap up that second part. Um, and again, uh, Newton's cradle elicits adaptation that transfers to launches. And Newton's cradle, remind, it's not just Newton's cradle. It's a real-world stimulus where you have the cause and the effect spatially separated. Yeah? Um, and yeah, the adaptation only works because there seem to be um, similar features between the normal launch and Newton's cradle that can transfer across those two stimuli. So they share something. Uh, it's a spatially specific mechanism that doesn't spread from cause to effect, but is specific to the cause and effect locations. Uh, we have those, uh, this evidence that there's a difference in how cause and the effect location treat the directional selectivity or how they are embedded. Um, and obviously we have a mechanism in place to link cause and effect across the spatial gap. And that's a very controversial finding. Um, and I'll show you, oh yeah, I brought some real world <laughs> stimuli just to show you how fantastic YouTube is as a resource and what people do with Newton's cradle stimuli. And the pretty complicated versions of this, like this one, uh, uh, the bottom one I think is really complicated. Wait a second. Well, it's not, that's not surprising, but if you add this other component, it's getting pretty difficult. Uh, and you can uh, look which one you like to adapt to, basically. Yeah. Um, so the initial studies, or all those studies that looked at how people rate the impressions of causality, claim that uh, delays, temporal delays, reduce the impression of causality, which is fine, but also that increasing or introducing a gap between the cause and effect strongly reduces the impression of causality. And our finding actually shows something uh, that contradicts that claim. The, the visual system can deal with spatial gaps and that there is not such a strong spatial constraint. So the visual system still is able 
um, to de uh, detect um, a, a launch with a spatial with a spatial gap. And this actually exploited a lot in animated movies. So there's a lot of stuff going on where the cause seems separated from the effect and we still can make sense of it. Uh, although it's often not clear um, whether this is really a perceptual thing or, or more cognitive. Um, but it seems to be strongly dependent on how we interpret actually what's happening in this gap. Yeah? So we have here a situation where um, you really have a gap, gap without anything in between. And by now, I have to say, I've seen that stimulus so often, I don't know what my impression here is, actually. Uh, uh, it could be still a launch for me, um, but a, a naive participant would actually always say, uh, that's not really a, a, a strong causal impression here. But if you add now something um, that bridges the two stimuli, um, that appears much more causal to participants as compared to the, to the situation without an explanation what could mediate actually that transfer from the moving first disk to the second disk. And that's kind of um, in line with our Newton's cradle stimulus also. There's an explanation actually uh, why uh, there's this uh, transfer of momentum of the motion. All right. And now I would like to uh, move on and go already to our last bit, which is about contextual influence on the perception of causality. So our finding, our initial finding is actually um, that there's directional selectivity. And uh, this is important to us because this indicates that something like detecting causal relations can occur already very, from very early on in the visual system. If you look at computational neuroscience, uh, you'll see that directional selectivity is one of the first things that the visual system extracts. Yeah? And you find species uh, that have mechanisms in place to, to extract directional selectivity already at the level of the retina. So um, to have a really bold claim that is not supported by any data, I think uh, I can imagine that we have a mechanism here in place that works across multiple stages, but actually could start already at the level of the retina, but could be integrated with other uh, information later on. And uh, we need this integration across multiple levels because we know already effects that cannot only be explained by a low level um, explanation. And these are the contextual influences. And uh, this is basically a thesis done by Ben Sommer at the moment. Uh, and I try to show you the phenomenology, uh, which is sometimes not working in bigger audiences, but I brought you all the results from the paper. But uh, here you go. We have this time two colored disks, and the first disk is, as usual, approaching the second disk. And if you are like me, you perceive here basically um, a pass. Are you with me? Who's seeing a pass here? And you might notice, not on the first time, that there's also this color switch taking place. Yeah? Um, i show you again. But this looks much like a pass. And now the interesting things come, uh, thing comes. You still have to judge the upper one. Yeah? But we add a second um, event below here. Uh, but look at the upper one and tell me what you see. It's more subtle, but it looks still like they are overlapping, of course, a lot. But it still looks like the, uh, the, that there is a launch actually happening. Who's seeing that? Okay, a rather small group, I have to admit. <laughs> um, so I show you now uh, the results from the original paper by Shole Nakayama. So if you only see the test event, participants typically um, uh, reported see, uh, seeing a launch only in 10% of the trials, roughly. Yeah? So they typically, they basically see a pass. But if you added those launch context events, um, 92% of participants reported seeing a launch. And that's just the most massive contextual uh, effect that you can uh, observe in such findings, uh, or in, in such studies. Um, and we were pondering now whether we actually need a, a working, a functioning local uh, causality detection at the test event in order to perceive these context events. So what we did is now, 
uh, we adapted at the test event location, and we're wondering whether we can still perceive uh, those context effects. Yeah. So that means, um, basically, do we need a functioning um, a local detection of launches at the test event location um, in order to still observe those context events? So what we do now here is participants fixate in the center of the screen. We again present those test events. As you've seen before, we can quantify the perception of causality. And now we added context events that could be either a launch or a pass. And the idea was a launch uh, would shift the curve more to perceiving more causality, more launches would shift it to the right, while a pass sh should shift it to the left. Yeah? Um, and that's exactly what we see. Uh, so the green curve is now, if you have an additional um, pass context, it's shifted more to the left, so you perceive less launches, always the same stimulus, but depending on the context, it's either shift, shifted to the left or the right. But compared to the very first study by Scholl and Nakayama, the effect is a bit underwhelming, uh, because I expected it to really hit uh, the borders of the plot and then always see the same thing as I do. Um, all right. But... Fortunately, uh, that rather small effect worked for us in the end. Uh, so what we did in the next step is um, uh, we adapted at the test event location. Yeah? So we tried to interfere with the ability to detect a launch at the test event location. Um, so we can now check what happens after adaptation. And it's hard to see a bit now here, but that's the curve is shifted a lot to the left if there's no context event. Um, and here we have the curves with context events. And now we see the difference, so the context effect here is the difference between the blue curve and the red curve, and this time we see a pretty strong uh, contextual influence. Yeah? So we see a lot more launches when there is an additional launch, but only by shifting basically the red curve to the left. So if we make a direct comparison what happened before and after adaptation, can look at those adaptation effects, and we see if there's no context effect, that's the thing I've shown you already multiple times, we see this huge adaptation response. Yeah? We, we interfere with how we perceive causality here. But if you present an additional context event, those curves are not shifted at all. Yeah? So, uh, and through this, uh, we get this huge uh, context effect. We can quantify this also by taking simply um, the cumulative sum, or you could also take some uh, mean across um, uh, the red and the uh, blue curves, uh, and you see here a slightly shift. So if there's a test event and you present, uh, present an additional um, launch context event, you perceive it slightly more often as a launch. And if there's a pass, you perceive it slightly more often as a, as a pass, and this difference between those bars is significant. But after the adaptation, you see, whoa, now we have a really strong context event, uh, context effect. And bringing this back to our um, initial question, um, let me see first. Um, yeah, that's a kind of summary of that finding. So we had strong evidence. So yeah, we had initially um, a rather, before adaptation, a rather weak causal capture effect, a rather weak context effect. Um, and the reason for this is probably because uh, we had them equidistantly presented and participants had just really good clear uh, or strong evidence that there was a pass. So you couldn't actually change it through a context event. Um, and they had the same color and not different colors as in the initial studies. So there are a number of differences between the original studies and our, which explains why the, uh, why the contextual effect was rather weak. But after uh, adaptation, it was really strong. And we were ask asking, do we need actually a proper functioning detection of causality at the test event location? The answer is no. Actually reducing it, reducing our evidence, what we see there, really helps to see, see these um, uh, contextual um, causal capture effects. All right. Uh, I want to conclude by showing you again uh, this space-time plot and uh, what we are interested in this line of research. Uh, we said that we want to use uh, visual adaptation protocols to look actually what features in that plot uh, we use to detect causal interactions with the visual system. And it's not the stimulus how it appears, so it's not important that there is um, uh, red dots on a white ball. Um, 
Uh, but what matters is actually the motion direction, and that's a new finding, um, so that the uh, embedding or this directional selectivity of how um, the detection of launches is um, um, encoded or detected, and that there are visual mechanisms in place to detect a launch at a distance. And there are also natural, other natural stimuli that have that. For instance, if you have a magnet that is pushing another magnet away, uh, that's also something where you have a launch at a distance that you could perceive. Um, yeah, we think it's functional relevant um, and it makes sense actually to embed such a, such a mechanism for detecting collisions as early as possible because it's it's really a relevant stimulus in our environment. Um, and optimally, we actually try to avoid collisions and make predictions uh, where they could occur. So uh, you want to respond as quickly as possible to potential collision. And therefore, it makes sense to have also um, a, a very early implementation, which allows you to make a, a prompt a response to such a stimulus. Uh, we see that it's possible to separate cause and effect and that they differ in their directional selectivity. And uh, finally, we found, we worked on those contextual influences that show you that you need to integrate uh, also information across uh, different spatial areas uh, or they, uh, they, they, um, uh, they co-influence each other. Um, and it's helpful to have weak evidence at a particular location, and then you will uh, use the information from another location to drive your percept what you see at those uh, at that location where you have weak evidence. Um, all right, and that's our still ongoing working hypothesis that the perception of causality starts at an early visual stage, but integrates uh, other visual signals at later stages. So I would like to thank you for being here, uh, also Martin Rawls, uh, which I did uh, most of the first project, and uh, now uh, the new lab members, uh, where a lot of them work also on that topic on, on, on the perception of causality. Thank you. Okay.